and then the fifth torpedo hit the Independence in the stern, on the starboard side, damage control went into action. The damage control people were already in helmets, flash-proof clothing and gloves, and lying prone on the deck of the carrier. All personnel of the carrier had been brought up at least to the second deck, except those whose action stations were below. The Independence began to list immediately. She went to 12 degrees to starboard, and then righted herself to 7 degrees. The engineering department began to write the list, and the flight deck crews moved the planes to help. The list was finally reduced to three degrees. Fires had started here and there. Men with hoses and extinguishers rushed to help put them out. Number 7 40mm gun was completely blown up and overboard to port, and one fighter on deck was bounced overboard by the explosion. A few men were lost below in the flooding of a number of compartments, but most made the upper decks when ordered. The explosion occurred about 30 feet from seven torpedoes stored in racks on the starboard side of the hangar, and they did not go up. Planes in the hangar had been spotted forward preparatory to recovering the last patrol, and so they were not in the way to take the brunt of the explosion and perhaps cause more damage themselves. Actually, the Independence was a very lucky ship. She had come through with less damage than one might have expected. Steering from bridge to rudder was lost in the explosion, so a changeover to aft steering was made, but she was steerable. Very shortly the Independence moved out, to travel under destroyer escort back to the safety of American waters. But so sturdy was she, and so well manned, that on the way back she was able to refuel a destroyer at sea, when the smaller vessel went short of fuel. Also, before entering port, two planes were launched from her flight deck, and the captain maintained that if there had been a little more wind, he could have conducted ordinary flight operations all the way along. Offshore, the rescue submarines were busy that day. The planes were striking the various islands to prevent the Japanese from moving air power over the beaches of Makin and Tarawa. The submarine plunger was operating off Mili, and according to instructions, she surfaced when she saw many American planes above. That meant the airstrike was on, and she should be alert to help if needed. From 3pm until nearly 4.15am, she waited on the surface, and then she saw a plane smoking, flying along with two others. One of the undamaged planes returned to the submarine's position, and indicated that the plunger should head eastward. By voice radio, the plane indicated that one pilot was down, ten miles away. The submarine began to move quickly, following the plane. A torpedo bomber fighter was soon in contact, telling them to move to a position ten miles from Knox Island. It took the submarine more than two hours to reach the point indicated, and by then it was half an hour after sunset. The captain of the submarine put up two lookouts in addition to the usual four, and was on the surface all night long. The officer on the bridge used a police whistle, and the submarine moved dead slow, calling constantly for the downed pilots. Every half minute the call went out, and the submarine crossed and crisscrossed the area. But it was a very dark night, and the lookouts saw nothing at all. And with the darkness on Tarawa came a new sort of activity. At sunset, the Japanese bombers from the marshals came in over the fleet to try to knock out some of the ships. The anti-aircraft guns of the ships offshore began to fire, making red and yellow splashes and sharp lines shooting through the night. Then suddenly it all stopped, and the island and the night were quiet, but not for long. Within an hour, the Japanese machine guns began firing, and the tracers stabbed across the beachheads where the marines had their heads down low. Also, oddly, from the shore came firing into the beachhead, and the marines realised that the Japanese from some of the pillboxes had swum out to the wrecked vehicles, and they either brought their weapons or managed to use the weapons of the disabled American equipment and were creating more damage, dealing more death in the night. The Japanese staged a counter-attack that night, and cut between beaches Red 2 and Red 3 to take the Long Pier once again. And then before dawn, the Japanese sent over one of their big flying boats to observe the fighting on the island. The men who had fought at Guadalcanal remembered the sort of flying boat, which they called Washing Machine Charlie, because of the somehow unplainly sound of the engines. Then the bomber circled back and forth across and around Betio, up and down the whole atoll, as if the men inside were making notes and sending back messages that would bring new attacks on the men in the foxholes.
dawn came pinkly, and with it the Japanese machine guns again opened up, as if the gunners were somehow finding something new at which to shoot. The bomber circled, dropped some bombs, and then dropped some more, which fell into the water, then it flew away. The first day at Batio was over, and the second was about to begin. As Julian Smith said later, if Admiral Keiji Shibasaki had brought his troops out in force that night to counterattack, they probably would have knocked the marines off their narrow beachhead, and the whole invasion might have failed. But Admiral Shibasaki did not know how desperate was the situation of the men on beaches Red 1, 2 and 3. He had relied on telephonic communications, and if the barrage laid down by the gunners of the ships and the planes had done nothing else, it had torn up the telephone wires around most of the pillboxes and other installations. So Admiral Shibasaki, in his command post, was as much out of the picture as was Ensign Ito huddled in his concrete pillbox. Meanwhile, as the night wore on, the commanders afloat and ashore were planning how best they might utilise their slender reserves to capture Betio with all possible speed and as little loss of life as possible. Colonel Elmer Hall and his reinforcements of the 1st Battalion, 8th Marine Regiment, who had been forgotten out at the point of departure for shore all night long, were finally instructed to land on Beach Red 2 and attack. They made it into a point about 500 yards from shore before the landing craft, vehicle, personnel grounded, and the men had to begin the long, deadly wading through the sea. En route they were hit, as the men had been the day before, by fire from both sides. The casualties were heavy, but by 8am the men on their feet were ashore and ready to fight. Their position was hampered considerably because they had lost their demolition charges and flamethrowers in the arduous passage over the reef. But it was made a bit better when they learned that the howitzers landed earlier had been brought together for a battery of five guns, and an earth embankment had been thrown up to protect the gunners. The new troops had the benefit of these guns from the very beginning, because as they came wading in, the howitzers zeroed in on the pillboxes that were firing on the beach and the water offshore, and knocked out several of the machine guns. On this second day, marines were going to try to fight across the island, and then down toward the men on Red One beachhead. The morning was spent in such preparation. Meanwhile, on Makin, considering the difference in number of defenders, the army troops were making almost abysmal progress. After the first of the 6,400 army troops landed early on the morning of D-Day, they made so little progress it seemed remarkable. Considering the opposition, Holland Smith would have expected the island of Butaritari to have been secured by dusk on D-Day. But not only was this not the case, the troops seemed totally disorganised. Holland Smith was particularly annoyed to learn that by the end of the day, the soldiers still had made no effort to recover and returned to the ships the body of their commanding officer, Colonel Conroy. Nor was the body returned on this second day as the fighting began again. Worried as Holland Smith was about the progress of events on Tarawa, he was still bound to the make-in operation. Terrible Turner was in charge, and Turner refused to let Smith go on over to the trouble spot. Not until make -in was secure, he said, then Smith could go anywhere he liked. So on the second day, Holland Smith went ashore with his aides, Major Woodrum and Captain Aspill, to make his own estimates of the situation as it developed. The beach was quiet, there was not a Japanese in sight. As he drove along, watching the troops in the open unloading supplies, a company of riflemen came through, firing to the right and left of the road, forcing the unloading parties to take cover. Holland Smith jumped down from his jeep and found the lieutenant in command. What was he firing at? asked the general. He was trying to clear out snipers, said the lieutenant. Smith lost his temper, and he pointed out in no uncertain terms that there were no Japanese in the area, and that the rifle company had best get up front several thousand yards away, where something was happening. The lieutenant insisted that he keep on, and then howling mad Smith, who had been intelligent enough to come ashore without any rank insignia so he would not become a sniper target, revealed his identity. If I hear one more shot from your men in this area, he said, I'll take your damn weapons and all your ammunition away from you. The area quieted down, and as for the fighting, that day it consisted largely of consolidating the beachheads. But the Japanese were stout resistors here as at Tarawa, even though their numbers were far fewer. 
Tank infantry teams had to work with flamethrowers and demolitions to clean out the pillboxes and prepared positions. Smith made his tour and went back to the command post to report to Turner. Enemy losses very heavy, own light, consider situation in hand. Still, Turner insisted that General Smith stay to wait for the end of the making action, and in his concern, the General's irritation with the army for moving so slowly began to build. He was incensed about the failure of the soldiers to recover Colonel Conroy's body, particularly when there was no danger in doing so. He sent a rocket of a message to Ralph Smith, commander of the division, ordering him to do so, and in itself that was very much of a reprimand. He was eager to get to Tarawa, where the trouble was, and it was true that there was plenty of trouble on Tarawa on D plus one. Colonel Shoup's plan for the second day called for the new troops landing to move westward toward the Red One beachhead and what was left of the 1st and 2nd battalions of the 2nd Marines to drive across the island, while Major Crow's unit was to reduce an enemy pocket that had been discovered at the base of the Burns Philpia. The 3rd battalion of the 2nd Marine Division was to go to the far end of the island, called Green Beach, and be sure the Japanese were driven from that point. Major Hayes had one medium tank, but he had no flamethrowers. They had been dropped in the water. He tried to move ahead, but without the flamethrowers the Japanese pillboxes seemed impregnable, so his advance was slow and tortuous, not at all satisfactory to the Major or anyone else. Major Kyle's 1st Battalion was to move across the airstrip to the ocean shore, from the lagoon where they had come in. They had to make use of whatever weapons they could find, and they were lucky, they had secured several old-fashioned water-cooled .30 caliber machine guns, and these were useful for keeping the Japanese heads down. They also found some .50 caliber machine guns on the beach and fought with these. They were lucky to have them, because the Japanese moved machine guns into position to prevent the other marines on the shore from reaching Kyle's men and reinforcing them with weapons or supplies. The Japanese hampered seriously by lack of communications and the heavy bombardment of the first day, were still well organised and defending themselves energetically. As the fresh troops came into the beach, the Japanese opened up on them with field guns. They would knock out a landing craft, and then when the marines started swimming in the water, the machine guns would open up on them. The Japanese also had some mortars in action, and they had sought every sort of concealment, from the broken-down tanks to an outhouse perched out over the water. The Marines found that outhouse in the morning and smashed it with mortar fire. The machine gun that was lacing the water suddenly stopped as the timber blew through the air. All this while, from morning on, the destroyers stood close by and fired on the Japanese positions beyond the Marines' perimeter. The carrier-based fighters came in to strike the enemy, and they made particular attempts to strafe and smash a rusted-out hulk of a freighter. The Japanese had swum out during the night and located a machine gun in the rusted hulk, and it was dealing death to the men in the water as they tried to come in over the reef. One Hellcat after another swooped down low, its guns spitting, and then came back up, but the machine guns still fired. Then came Hellcats carrying small bombs, and they tried to zero in on the enemy position. Two of the bombers missed, but one did not. The hulk erupted in a sheet of flame, but only one of a dozen fighters that came in carrying bombs managed to hit the target. The others all missed, one by two hundred yards. The trouble this day came from the snipers who had managed to conceal themselves behind the Marines' lines. They gave the Marines hell all day long, and they were as hard to find as beetles in a grass pile. As the Marines managed to edge inland, the coconut trees became the big problem. On the first day they had spent a good amount of attention on the coconut trees, knocking snipers out by the process of trial and error. But on the second day, they found the trees that had been cleared the day before were again infested, and the job had to be done over again, while marines were shot, wounded and killed. The positions were still insecure. Colonel Shoup, the commander, still had his command post 15 yards inland from the beach. It was a hole in the sand behind that Japanese pillbox, and the pillbox was 40 feet long, 8 feet wide, and ten feet high, made of coconut logs at least six inches in diameter, piled in two tiers, three feet apart, with the inner space filled with sand, and the whole top was covered with sand. It was a marvellous protection against shelling, and had done very well, 
for when bombs hit beside such pillboxes, they simply threw more sand up on them. It took a direct hit from a heavy bomb to knock one out. If the Japanese had failed to take advantage of opportunity and attack on the night before, they were not repeating the error this day. The 1st Battalion of the 2nd Marines started an advance toward the south coast and reached the area, taking an abandoned strongpoint some 200 yards long. But they had hardly jumped down into the Japanese trenches than they were subjected to an attack by the Japanese and barely beat it off. Lieutenant Colonel Jordan now came to this point with his 75 men, the remaining men of the 2nd Battalion who had managed to get ashore in the original position on Red One. They joined Kyle's 135 men and now hoped to move along to link up with Crow near the Burns Filt Pier. But the going was desperately slow. The amphibious tractors came in shore now, picked up wounded marines, then took them back to the shore and out to the ships for safety. The marines pressed on. Kyle managed to cross the airstrip and take command of a perimeter along the south coast of the island, although strong Japanese positions lay within 25 yards of the marines on east and west. The marines were in control, but barely. Major Crow's unit found the fighting very hard and mad little headway on D plus one. To the east of the Burns Filp Pier, there were just too many fortified Japanese positions, which could only be cleaned out with tanks, flamethrowers and demolition charges, all of them in short supply. They advanced to the main airfield runway, but had to fall back as night began to lower, lest they be cut off from the rest of the battalion. So they went back to the Burns Filp Pier, and there they fought off a succession of Japanese infiltration attempts during the night and strengthened the position of the morning. Thus, the Makin beachhead, as night fell, extended from 400 to 500 yards along the coast of the lagoon, on both sides of the long pier. The Americans had not yet taken the airfield, so there was a gap of 250 yards separating the south perimeter from that of the west. The Red 2 and Red 3 beachhead had been enlarged, but there were still gaps in it and still plenty of opportunity for the Japanese to infiltrate, which they began to do with sundown. On the west, Green Beach, the western side of the island, was taken by Ryan and his men, in the face of several boat guns, machine guns and two five-inch naval guns. Ryan's success was the brightest spot in Julian Smith's day, for with the capture of the west end of the island, for the first time in the invasion, reinforcing troops could be landed without coming under withering Japanese fire. And the plan was to land the 6th Marines, the last of the reserves, just as soon as it became apparent where their weight would be felt most strongly. This was a matter that caused some spitting and cursing ashore. That damned sixth is cocky enough already, one officer told correspondent Sherrod as they crouched in Colonel Shoup's command post. Now they'll come in and claim they won the battle. It was not so long before that other marine units had evened the score, at least partly, with the arrogant sixth by giving derogatory remarks but it would be a time yet before the 6th arrived, and there was plenty of glory and death for all. Correspondent Sherrod sometimes had the feeling that he and those around him were the only ones left alive in the whole invasion force. That feeling was reinforced during the day when a Japanese soldier reached out from an air vent in the pillbox behind the command post and shot a marine in the leg. Finally, everyone realised they were sitting on top of a nest of Japanese, just three feet of coconut and concrete and sand separating them from God knew how many of the enemy. But late in the day, Sherrod encountered reinforcements of his own kind. He and Bill Hippie of the Associated Press moved back down to Major Crow's beleaguered position, and there they met up with Associated Press photographer Frank Filan and United Press correspondent Richard W. Johnston, a figure so tall in his fatigues that he would have made a fine target except that his figure was as skinny as his moustache. They amused themselves and comforted one another by telling stories about themselves and other correspondents. Don Senek, the newsreel man, Johnston claimed, should get the Purple Heart, because he had been sitting under a coconut tree when a bullet hit the trunk above his head and dropped hot on his leg. This sort of joke did something to take away the horror all around them, the dreadful calm disinterest of death in combat, where one Marine was not so lucky. He was standing behind a coconut tree when an American 75mm howitzer shell exploded on the trunk and fragments killed him.
By evening, there were certain encouraging signs that raised the spirits of marines and correspondents alike. The first jeeps came onto the island, towing 37mm anti-tank guns that could be invaluable in knocking out the pillboxes. And at regimental headquarters, Colonel Shoup at last could say, Well, I think we are winning, even though everyone knew the Japanese were still fighting and would continue to fight. During the afternoon, General Julian Smith had two reports that Japanese had been seen wading across the shallow lagoon to the island of Bairiki. So, he diverted the 2nd Battalion of the 6th Marines to that island, to be sure that the Japanese did not get solidly dug in. In fact, there were 15 Japanese on that island, with a machine gun. When the Marines came under fire, Smith called for an airstrike, and a plane came in and began to strafe the position where the Japanese were reported. That afternoon, the Marines on Beitio were complaining about the incompetence of the air people. They haven't hit 50 people in two days, one grimy fighter grumbled, but here on Bairiki, the single Hellcat created a spectacle as impressive as a Roman circus. One lucky shot hit a can of gasoline in the Japanese pillbox. It went up with a flare and a whooshing explosion, and all 15 Japanese soldiers were roasted in a structure that had suddenly turned into an oven. The second battalion of the 6th Marines landed without any opposition at all. It was so quiet some of them felt foolish when they did not find a single live Japanese defender on the island. Even with the advantage of being able to land on a cleared beach, the 1st Battalion of the 6th Marines had its problems. It was bringing in tanks. When the men went to bring them out, they discovered them buried under masses of supplies in the bottoms of the transports. When the Marines got into their rubber boats, they found they were 1,200 yards off the beach and had to be towed in all the way by landing craft. When they reached the beach, they found it was mined. A landing vehicle tracked carrying water, food and medical supplies was the first to hit a mine and was destroyed. The rest of the 1st Battalion moved to the northern portion of the beach. The battalion was ashore by dark and was planning a night attack when an order came from division headquarters to hold up until the morning. That would give the men time to sort the tanks from the piles of supplies and to make it into shore to support the attack. So as evening came, Colonel Shoup could say guardedly to General Julian Smith, Casualties were many, but percentage dead was not known. Combat efficiency, we are winning. Back aboard Turner's flagship, the word was passed to Howling Mad Smith, who was ashore on Butaritari, fuming at the incompetence of the army. At least he knew his marines were doing all right. The Gilbert's invasion caught the Japanese by surprise, because they had really been expecting action in the more important marshals, but even in this they would have been sorely hampered by losses in their air power. They had been counting on carrier and land-based planes to turn the tide, but the carrier raids on the islands and the losses at Rabaul in early November made it impossible for the Japanese airmen to react. Admiral Koga, the commander of the combined fleet, knew the fleet was already reeling from the blows struck at Rabaul and Bougainville. One reason for the immense destruction of aircraft by the American bombers at Rabaul was that Koga had just a few days before moved all his carrier-based planes ashore for a major strike against American ships in the New Guinea area. The Battle of Empress Augusta Bay, early in November, had deprived Japan of half a dozen of her warships, sunk or damaged. And then the airstrikes at Simpson Harbour put four more cruisers out of action and tied up two others, escorting them back to Truk. Even though in early November, Tokyo knew from the heavy air attacks on Tarawa that the Gilberts would be the next landing target, there was virtually nothing they could do except cheer Admiral Keiji Shibasaki on in his defence efforts at Betio. They never told the Admiral that his hopes for air support were now forlorn, that the heavy guns of Admiral Kurita's cruisers could not be brought up to help him. On November 19, while the carrier planes were still softening up, Betio and the invasion forces had not yet appeared, and Admiral Takagi aboard his flagship at Truk was pressed for help. Takagi was the submarine force commander, and he represented just about all the warships that Japan could throw into this battle. Takagi began to act. First, he ordered I-169 to make in from its patrol area between Hawaii and the Marshals. The submarine captain, Lieutenant Commander Zenshin Toyama, indicated that the boat was near the end of its endurance, but that made no difference. The need was too great. Takagi laid out an interception line that ran north of Makin 
and sent I-169, I-19, I-40, and the smaller submarine RO-38 to the area. I-19, which was equipped with an airplane, had just returned from a reconnaissance mission. The plane had flown over Pearl Harbor and checked the shipping situation. It was hurriedly put into service again and sent to sea, and I-40 was a brand new submarine, just down from Tokyo, and scarcely through with its shakedown crews. Row 38 was also a new submarine. Its captain, Lieutenant Commander Shunki Nomura, was serving on his first cruise as a submarine commander. Takagi sent many confusing orders. First he established one line of deployment, and then another, and Lieutenant Commander Yamamoto in I-35 was a part of that picture. On November 21, he was coming very close to Tarawa, and he surfaced that night and sighted a large enemy task force. When the invasion began on D-Day, the naval vessels off Tarawa's shore had been put on the alert to expect aerial counterattack from the Japanese. They were alert, so much so that when a single plane came in toward the fleet at 300 feet that afternoon, the gunners opened fire and put a ring of steel around it. Luckily their shooting was not very good, because the plane was actually one of the Maryland's observation planes, bringing Lieutenant Colonel Jesse Cook of the 2nd Marine Division to the fleet. The plane landed to escape the fire and stayed down on the water all night long, before the pilot felt it was safe to taxi to the battleship and deposit his passenger. It was the second day before the Japanese were able to offer any kind of support at all to the defenders of Betio. Early in the morning, just before dawn, eight Japanese planes showed up, but their pilots had been badly briefed. They came in over Betio, dropped their bombs without any apparent mission in mind, and soared off to their bases in the marshals. That was the extent of the Japanese support of Admiral Shibasaki that day. Admiral Hill and his captains were on the alert for an air attack from Mili or Malolap, but it did not materialise that day. Mili and Jaluit were the two Marshall atolls nearest the Gilberts, but they were in no position to respond to the American attacks. For two days the American carriers had sent their planes over these islands and plastered them with bombs and laced their sands with machine gun fire. On November 21, D plus 1, Admiral Hill learned that one of the escorting destroyers reported a submarine contact, and he left two of his destroyers behind to deal with it. They spent the whole day chasing echoes and firing depth charges, and at the end of it came back to announce that they thought they had damaged the submarine. But the Japanese records did not indicate any such activity at that time. The carrier force also found a big Mavis four-engine flying boat and shot it down. D plus one ended with the Japanese totally unable to help their beleaguered comrades in the Gilberts. All night long on November 20, the submarine plunger continued to search for the downed aviator it had been sent to rescue, but without success. Just before 6am in the morning, the captain took the plunger down. It was quite usual to dive at dawn. The enemy might find them in the early light, and it was very difficult to see into the air. Also, it was always wise to begin the day with the boat in trim, and the way to check it was to dive. Back on the surface in less than an hour, the plunger headed out in search once more. She headed for Knox Island to establish her position, and steamed in an expanding square, the tracks of the succeeding legs being a mile outside those of the previous ones. And as they moved, they listened to the radio, which told them of new strikes on Mili. By eleven in the morning, the plunger's captain had decided the search for the downed aviator was futile. Perhaps he had been rescued, but more likely he had simply vanished in the moor of the ocean. So the captain shaped a course for Malolap, which would take them south and west of Mili, so he could keep an eye out for any downed aviators. Since the ship was in enemy waters, he had three surface lookouts and two men with their glasses focused on the sky. At 1am, the submarine had a message, Hello, lifeguard. I have a message for you. But the radio communications were not working satisfactorily, and the plunger could not reply on a frequency the other could pick up. Two torpedo bombers began to circle the submarine, and Captain Bass sensed that they were trying to show him another pilot was down somewhere. But where? They ran into a squall, and through the blinding rain began to signal by searchlight to the planes. Where is the plane down? but the planes could not answer their searchlight communications. One of the planes came over and made a message drop, and then another, 
but the water was too choppy, and the submarine could not locate the plane if there was one. The men could not get in touch with the planes above. It was a very frustrating day, and that evening the plunger sent a message back to Pearl Harbor, telling Admiral Lockwood that they could hear on frequency 6,835, but could not answer. That message was sent to the carriers from Pearl Harbor that night. Next morning, D plus two, the plunger was still searching for that downed aviator of two days earlier, without result. Shortly after dawn, the men on the deck of the submarine saw fires on Mealy and watched the raid in progress. At eight in the morning, the plunger had a message that a survivor had been spotted about 23 miles from Knox Island and the submarine headed out. On the way, planes helped direct her, correcting her course, and two hours later, the submarine neared the pilot. During the submarine's approach, a pair of planes circled the downed pilot and then came to beckon the submarine, but then the planes ran low on gas and had to head back to their carriers. The plunger moved in cautiously, for there were a large number of blips on the radar. There was no way to know if they were friend or foe. Captain Bass waited for more American planes to appear to guard the downed pilot until they could pick him up, but none came. He had radar contacts at as little as five miles away. Who were they, these other pilots, American or Japanese? Until Bass knew it would be foolhardy to attempt the rescue, the captain would not put any men on deck until he knew what was going on, he might have to dive on short notice, and any men left on deck were almost certain to be lost. Just before 11.30am, the men on the submarines sighted the downed pilot in his rubber boat on the crest of a wave, about a mile away from them. They turned, and soon had him close off the port bow, and just as they headed up, a zero came in at them out of a rain squall in a shallow dive. Simultaneously, Captain Bass sounded the diving alarm and gave the order to clear the bridge. The lookouts and the captain leaped for the hatch as the zero came in strafing. The Japanese pilot was good. His bullets laced the length of the submarine towards the bridge as the captain dropped down the hatch, last man in, and the bullets clanged off the bridge as the hatch cover was pulled down. From his little rubber boat, the downed pilot saw the zero turn over in a quick pull-up and roll over and reverse field, then come in strafing again, snap around once more, and make a third pass at the submarine just as the periscope shears went underwater. Down they went, to 140 feet, and levelled off. The captain then had time to breathe, he checked. The executive officer, Lieutenant William George Brown, had been wounded by the strafing. Pharmacist's mate Arthur Mullinix began to give him first aid, and then the captain learned that five others were wounded. It was nearly half an hour before the plunger returned to the surface to make another attempt to rescue the downed pilot. The Zero pilot either had not seen him or had shown compassion, for the man in the raft was still there, drifting, waiting. Gingerly, the submarine came to periscope depth and sighted the pilot, and when no planes were detected, it came up to the surface. In a few moments, two of the ship's officers helped Lieutenant Franklin George Schwartz out of his rubber boat and onto the firm footing of the submarine deck. At full speed, the plunger headed south, searching for medical attention for the wounded men. The captain did not yet know how badly they were injured. It would be thirty hours before the wounded were taken from the submarine, but the injuries were superficial. All the men would recover nicely. Meanwhile, the Japanese submarine I-35 was moving in the waters off Tarawa. She had arrived on the evening of the 22nd and had tried to enter the lagoon, but she was spotted by a destroyer and a plane, which came in to depth charge her. The destroyer dropped two depth charges and came very close. Lieutenant Commander Yamamoto had dived deep, but the depth charges knocked out the lights and broke crockery in the galley. Yamamoto stayed down for two and a half hours in the darkening night. He moved east and then back north to the lagoon, but could not enter. He moved north and then south again. Still, he did not dare to enter. That night, they saw a transport ship entering the lagoon, obviously taking supplies to the American Marines ashore. Yamamoto tracked it, but he could not get into position to fire any torpedoes, so the night passed. Just after five in the morning, Yamamoto brought I-35 to the surface. He saw no enemy ships or planes. Suddenly out of the clouds came two American planes, zooming down. Yamamoto gave the order to clear the bridge and to dive, and as they went down the bombs dropped in their wake. 
Yamamoto moved away from the danger zone, outside the destroyer screen that shielded the attacking forces. At 11 that morning, I-35 was east of the destroyer screen, at a depth of 65 feet, when suddenly the sound of speeding propellers shocked Yamamoto to attention. Aboard the destroyer Gansevoort, the sound man reported to the bridge that he had a contact, and the destroyer wheeled and began to bear down on it at high speed. Gansevoort came in and began dropping depth charges in the location of the contact. I-35 went down to 260 feet, but as she went the depth charges were falling around her. The lights went out, then bulbs began shattering in the sockets from the concussion. The submarine began to shake, she sprang leaks in the plating. The destroyers Meade and Frazier now came up to help. They roamed back and forth above the hapless submarine, stopped and silent in the depths. Each time they passed the point where she lay, they dropped depth charges, altogether nearly 70 of them. Yamamoto took her deeper to 390 feet, but he could not escape. The instruments in the conning tower shattered from the concussion, and the gauges broke in the control room, the clocks broke down. At this depth, the packing around the diving planes came loose from the changing pressure, and the rivets began to give, weakened by the constant pounding. The hull ruptured, and then the fuel tanks broke, and the submarine began to take on water with alarming speed. Yamamoto tried to move, but now discovered that the depth charging had cost him control. The rudder was not operating. One final attack caused the submarine to nose down at an angle of 20 degrees, and Yamamoto knew he could not take her deeper. The pressure would crush the hull. So he blew the tanks and came to the surface, hoping to start the diesel engines and run away from the enemy ships. It was a forlorn hope. As he surfaced, he saw all around him the destroyers and cruisers of the enemy, and as the conning tower broke water, the surface ships began to hurl a devastating fire at the submarine. Two of the cruisers launched their float planes with bombs, and they came over, bombing and strafing. A destroyer's shell wrecked the conning tower, and a bomb exploded the ammunition locker of the deck gun. As the submarine broke water, the gun crew began piling up the ladder of the conning tower to get on deck and man their guns. But the trainer, the pointer and the gunnery officer were all killed in the attempt. Other men went out, and they too fell beneath the hail of lead and flame. Superior Petty Officer Ichiro Yamashita pulled himself out of the wrecked conning tower and made it onto the deck. He headed for the deck gun, but he never reached it. He was felled by a bullet from one of the strafing planes and dropped unconscious. First Class Petty Officer Shigeto Ohata was just behind Yamashita. His duty was at the diving plane control when the ship was submerged, but on the surface he helped man the machine gun. He headed for his post, but he too was knocked down by a bullet or shrapnel and fell unconscious. Second Class Petty Officer Takashi Kawano was assigned to the deck gun, and he too headed for his post. But he saw that the ammunition locker had exploded, and he decided he would man the .50 caliber anti-aircraft machine gun, so he headed for it, reached the gun and armed it. Just then one of the planes came in strafing, and Kawano felt a shock and then saw blood on his right hand. Two fingers had disappeared, shot off, then another bullet struck him, and he fell to the deck and could remember nothing more. The planes strafed and bombed, and the guns of the ships found the submarine with accuracy. Men poured onto the deck and died. The captain came up and was shot down. The submarine took in water. The Frasier charged in and rammed I-35, and in a few moments she sank, leaving three men in the water. Kawano came to and found himself clinging to a piece of wreckage. The destroyers came up then and rescued the three survivors, the only ones left alive of a crew of 81 men and nine officers. Captain James Jones was assigned to lead a small reconnaissance force to Abamama Atoll. They had sailed on the submarine Nautilus, scheduled to land on the night of November 19 to determine whether or not the atoll was heavily defended. No one thought so. Aerial photographs had indicated there were virtually no defences at all. The Marines boarded the submarine at Pearl Harbour, but then the Nautilus had a job to do at Tarawa. She was to watch for Japanese shipping, and so they went to that point. After the Nautilus left Tarawa and surfaced to make the run of 76 miles to the little atoll more quickly, she was spotted by the destroyer Ringgold, and the Ringgold attacked her, as has already been recounted.
The Nautilus arrived off Abamama before dawn on November 20. Jones and his men embarked in rubber boats and landed on one of the five islands of the outer curve of Abamama, the five together strung out rather like a half-bracelet. They intended to land at the base of the bracelet on the island called John, but the current moved them down to the absolute end of the bracelet, to the island called Joe. There they found nothing, so they crossed over the narrow waterway to John and ran into a three-man Japanese patrol, ambushed it, killed one Japanese, and moved to the next little island, Orson. Three islanders met them and informed them that there were about 25 Japanese in defensive positions on the southern tip of the next island, Otto. By this time it was November 23, and Jones felt that he should take the position. He moved against it, but the Japanese had organised their defence well. Fire from their rifles and Nambu machine guns drove the Americans back. Jones then decided to use strategy. Next morning, the Nautilus moved in and shelled the Japanese on Otto with her deck gun, thus attempting to attract and hold their attention. The plan then was for Jones and his men to disengage, get into the rubber boats, bypass the stronghold, and attack from the rear. But the Japanese were shrewd and brave. They kept firing steadily on the boats every time anyone went near them and pinned the Americans down. Late that day, a destroyer came up and began firing into the Japanese position, and that is how the day ended, in stalemate, with the Americans using two warships and a superior force of men to fight two dozen Japanese. That night it was quiet. Next morning early, an islander came across and reported to Jones that all the Japanese were dead. How could that be? Jones and his men went patrolling, and soon discovered the fact four of the Japanese had been killed in the bombardment. The remaining eighteen had committed self-termination in the night, Sure, the Americans would land men in force from the destroyer on the next day. The Marines had lost two men killed and one wounded. Abamama was taken. On the night of November 21, General Ralph Smith asked for permission to land troops on Kuma Island, north of Butaritari in the Makin Atoll, to cut off the Japanese retreat. He had asked this before. In fact, he had wanted to put troops ashore there on D-Day, but since such a landing was not a part of the original plan, Holland Smith had refused the change. He and Admiral Turner had conferred and agreed that no subsidiary landings were in order until it was certain that the Japanese could be driven from Butaritari and that island made secure. On the third day it was so certain that the fighting was nearly over on Butaritari that there was no further objection. So a detachment of the 105th Infantry went ashore on Kuma in landing vehicle tracked, ready to fight, and found nothing there but another welcoming party of Gilbert Islanders, who grinned and waved and offered them coconuts. But still, the Army Infantry made slow going on Butaritari, much to the disgust of Holland Smith, who was hourly fretting to be on his way to Tarawa, where the trouble was. On November 23, the 3rd Battalion of the 165th Infantry came out of reserve and crossed the eastern tank trap, which the Japanese had crossed two nights earlier. Beyond the tank trap, the island was heavy with vegetation, which meant good vantage points for snipers. At night, the Japanese infiltrated the American positions and attacked in small groups, but each attack was beaten off. The soldiers were learning, and in the morning, they found 51 dead Japanese in front of the positions of the battalion. They had lost three killed and 25 wounded during the night. So on the morning of November 23, the soldiers swept to the end of the island, without meeting any further resistance. General Ralph Smith's men then began counting the casualties. The army had 218, 66 of them killed or dead of wounds. About 450 Japanese had been killed. One Japanese soldier was captured and 100, four Korean labourers surrendered. At 11am, General Ralph Smith signalled Admiral Turner offshore. Make in taken. Recommend command pass to command a garrison force. Long as it had been, and incompetent as he believed the army to be in its operation here, General Holland Smith was relieved and pleased at the message. Now he could leave the task force and get over to Tarawa where he belonged. On the evening of the second day, Major Crow had looked sourly about the beachhead. He cursed the planes bombing and strafing, and commented that they had not done anything worthwhile in two days. The biggest obstacle he had, which kept him pinned to the beach, was a big blockhouse, 
covered on one side by a steel shelter and on the other by a concrete pillbox. The blockhouse was formidable. It should have been. It was Admiral Shibasaki's command post and he was there. He had tried to get to the smaller post at the shore, but he had failed, and so he was spending the battle in his old place, the most formidable spot on the island. All afternoon of the second day, the Marines had launched attacks against the blockhouse without success. The Japanese in the area seemed to be coming at them constantly. The Marines could not figure out how. But there they were, stopping Lieutenant Alexander Bonniman and his engineers from getting close enough to hurl satchel charges into the openings or to use flamethrowers effectively. In the evening, frustrated, Crow had called for a naval strike against the blockhouse, and a destroyer had come in so close some of the Marines thought she would run aground. The destroyer began to fire, and laid in some 85-inch shells. Crow watched, still sour. They had not hit the blockhouse, they had just churned the sand all around it. The Major might not have been so glum had he known the situation inside the blockhouse. Admiral Shibasaki and his staff were assembled, with a still formidable force of fighting men, but they knew the end was near. At sunset, the Admiral composed his final message to Tokyo, Our weapons have been destroyed. From now on, everyone is attempting a final charge. Banzai, not in this big fortress, but in the ruins of the hospital dugout that had been burned out, Petty Officer Unuki had awaked to find himself, surprisingly, still alive. He was surrounded by the dead, bloated bodies of his comrades. As he worked himself clear, he heard voices in English. He looked out the hole in the pillbox and saw the superstructure of a ship moving. By the time that Admiral Shibasaki was composing his last message, Unuki had regained enough strength so that the instinct for survival returned. He decided to escape to the island of Bairiki, and so as soon as it was dark he had dug a hole and buried his clothes in the pillbox, and then crept out. He had made his way, staggering toward the end of the island nearest by Ricky. He saw many shapes and shadows in the wreckage of the palm trees and the buildings. He knew they were enemy. He crept more cautiously, and although he was fired at, he was not hit. At the end of Betio, he had stepped off into the cool water, not more than three feet deep, and begun wading across the reef to the other side. Halfway across he saw a figure, and somehow sensed that it was Japanese. He did not make a sound or try to catch up to the other. He just moved ahead, slowly, toward his haven. Half an hour after moonrise he had reached his goal. He stepped ashore on the beach, found a bunker, and stepped inside, expecting to find friends there. And they were there, but they were not alive. The room was full of charred corpses, victims of marine flamethrowers, men who had died as horribly as his companions in the pillbox back on Betio. He was sick, and there was only one way out, he decided. The marines were here too, and there was no escape. He must commit self-termination. So he looked around for something to cut his wrists. He found nothing at all but a seashell, so he picked it up and began scraping his wrist, but it was not sharp enough to cut, and he began to cry, and he dropped the seashell and sank down. In a few seconds he was asleep. Out in the lagoon on the evening of the second day, in one of the tipped, tortured amphibious tractors that had received a direct shell hit from the shore in the early minutes of the battle, there was a stirring. The Amtrak was a gory hellhole. Parts of bodies lay everywhere on one side, seeking whatever shelter it gave him, lay a single marine, alive. He had shrapnel in his arms, his legs, his head, and he was suffering from thirst and hunger and shock. It was a wonder his wounds and the heat of the Betio sun had not killed him yet. He and his buddy had been the only two survivors of the whole Amtrak full of marines, and his buddy had lasted just until the end of D-Day, and now it was the second night. All day long when he was conscious, the marine had heard the sounds of gunfire, the popping of the Japanese rifles and the sputter of the Nambu machine guns, then the roar of the bigger guns, the whine and the scream of planes coming in, the whirring and the blast of bombs and big shells from the ships. But it did not mean anything. It was all a crazy quilt. All that meant anything was the sun and the heat and pain. That night he felt he could not go on. He could not see. His eyes were clotted over with dried blood from his wounds, and he knew his throat was on fire, and he hurt everywhere. He found his rifle, pointed it at his face, and tried to pull the trigger, and he was too weak to manage. 
He fell back in the darkness in the cooling Amtrak, and he slept. When Colonel Edson reached the command post on Tarawa at 8.30 that night of the second day, he and Colonel Shoup began making plans for the next day's attack. First of all, they could use some big gun support from the sea, so they asked the Navy to fire on the eastern end of Betio, keeping 500 yards ahead of the friendly troops. This meant they had to confine their firing to the eastern third of the island. Strong Japanese fortifications still lay ahead, particularly before the positions inland from Red 1 and Red 2, where the Marines had pushed ahead. There were also some well-defended places inland from the burns Philp Pier, but by this time the superiority of the American military might had begun to count. The Japanese were deserted on their atoll, left to die by a high command that had invoked the spirit of the Emperor, and apparently even his words, in Admiral Shibasaki's blockhouse. They had no more guns, ammunition or men than before. They had virtually nothing left with which to fight, and by this time all of them knew it. The Americans were moving tanks, half-tracks, machine guns, flamethrowers, artillery and more men in. The Marines brought guns onto nearby Bariki, from which they could join in the shelling of the Japanese on Betio. At 6am on the morning of November 22, the third day, the destroyers moved around until they could open up on the tail end of the island, where the Japanese were now concentrated. They were shooting at the big blockhouse where Admiral Shibasaki had taken refuge under the cover of the diversion staged by Petty Officer Unuki and the others. So, a hail of 5-inch naval gunfire, a hail of 75mm howitzer fire, and everything else that could be thrown at the enemy was concentrated on this area. Half an hour after the bombardment began, the planes began to move in on the end of the island, dive bombers screaming in, and then fighters coming down to strafe, but they could do little against the double logs and concrete of the defences. It took a direct hit, and a lucky one at that, from a 1,000-pound bomb to blow up a blockhouse of the Tarawa type. At 7am, the 1st Battalion of the 8th Marines attacked on the west, supported this day by three light tanks. A tank would move up to a pillbox and fire point-blank into the openings. Then Marines would throw in grenades and dynamite charges, and other Marines would move in with flamethrowers, but the Japanese continued to fire their own 37mm guns and their machine guns, with good effect against the light tanks that came up so bravely. The tanks and some other vehicles also fell victim to mines. The Japanese had sowed 3,000 small contact mines on the south and west beaches, but the Marines had more resources today. The extension of the beachheads and the wiping out of much of the Japanese power had brought about a new situation. The tanks could land... The gunners were no longer getting killed, jeeps could come in, and half-tracks too, and self-propelled guns with armour shielding. And they came. Early that morning there was a certain relaxation at the command post. Colonel Edson and Colonel Carlson and others who had been through the South Pacific could compare this battle to Guadalcanal. It was far worse, they all agreed, and Carlson said it was the toughest fighting he had seen in thirty years, which went back to service in World War I, and a sojourn with the Chinese Communist Eighth Route Army. Those in the command post had the feeling that the officers were now talking of the battle in the past tense. Even though the guns were booming and the machine guns rattling, and there were still many shots to be fired, the officers sensed that the battle was won and the island taken. Even 24 hours earlier, the bets might have been hedged more than a little bit. Even then, the Marines had fighting to do. And it was proved when one of the self-propelled 75mm guns was knocked out by Japanese fire that holed its radiators. This battalion had tough going. The Japanese contested every position, and the main effect of their fight was not so much to gain ground as to kill enemy troops. The Japanese even staged a counter-attack in this area of Red 1 and Red 2 strongpoints, and they were beaten back at a frightful toll. But at the end of the day, they were still fighting, even though surrounded by the Marines. The big difference on D plus two was the 1st Battalion of the 6th Marine Regiment. Major Jones launched his attack at eight in the morning. It was led by three light tanks, with the infantry coming up 50 yards behind. A Japanese rushed forward, threw himself under a tank, and pulled the pin on his grenade. It exploded. He died. But the grenade did not even knock the tread off the tank, 
The infantry protected the tanks and the tanks forged ahead to assault the blockhouses and other posts from point-blank range. The flamethrowers were at work too, and this system worked well for the Americans. The Japanese blockhouses became death traps from which there was no escape. In the course of about three hours, one marine unit killed 250 of the defenders and moved ahead to make contact with the 1st Battalion of 2nd Marines, and still there was a war going on. From offshore that morning, a destroyer's shell found an undiscovered fuel dump in the middle of the island, and the hole erupted in a great greasy gout of flame and smoke. 